Hello lovely viewers, DCH are today bringing you our most realistic prediction for the future ahead following Brexit. But to make a decent prediction of how life will be following Brexit, we must first look at the past. Fact. Hit the beat. Hmm, bit strange but we'll roll with it. Okay, so voting for the referendum took place on the 23rd of June 2016, with over 30 million people voting during the day. At around 1am the following day, as votes were being totted up, the pound dropped by roughly 10% compared to the US dollar as investors began to realise that Leave had a chance of winning. The Leave campaign eventually won with 52% of the overall vote, which is just over 18 million people. Then, on the 24th of June 2016, just hours after the referendum result was declared, Prime Minister David Cameron announced his resignation, saying that he'd act as the caretaker whilst the Tories chose a new party leader. The Bank of England Governor Mark Carney followed up quickly by offering to pump £250 billion into the UK's financial system, hoping this will ease the collapse of the markets and bring about confidence again. Then for a while after that, not a lot happened. High up Tories were flinging shit at each other much like the monkeys of any monkey-related zoo. England got knocked out of the Euros. Chronic arsewipe Boris Johnson dubiously stepped down from the race. He was soon followed by Mr Bean looky likey George Osborne and frog-faced wanker Michael Gove or Froggy for short. Soon, the race for Prime Minister was down to two female candidates. Either Andrea Leadsom, a Brexit supporter who was driven by God, family and hatred for gays, or Theresa May, who idolised Thatcher so much she decided to dig up the old hag and wear her wig for good luck. On the 11th of July, May was our new Prime Minister, and she saw about getting to work immediately, showing that she had a rather dry sense of humour by making Liz We Don't Sell Enough Cheese Trust our new Justice Secretary, and Bojo the Clown our new Foreign Minister, a man who literally described the Turkish Prime Minister as the Wankara from Ankara. Ugh, this man is in charge of our foreign affairs. Bloody hell. But anyway, that brings us up to about now. Here's a clone of me with the weather. Thank you, Bob. We're looking at some pretty hot weather over the next couple of weeks. Temperatures reaching low 30s. Perfect conditions for violence and rioting as people begin to realize just how badly the situation will be in the coming years. I'm personally looking forward to the new summer sale bargains, some Yeezys and a new TV, so long as I can beat off the crowd of looters accompanying me in the shop. Back to you in the studio, and that's Bob with the weather. Okay, so until Article 50 is triggered, we're still in the EU, and as such, not much will happen. When Article 50 will be triggered is a mystery, with May and Froggy looking to keep it on hold, whilst the UK established a negotiating bench with the rest of the EU. The bookies predict that the article will most likely be triggered at some point this year, but May has already gone on record to say it won't be triggered in 2016. As the UK are the country that must trigger Article 50 for everything to be set in motion, it's a safe bet to assume the Prime Minister isn't going to change her mind. I also personally think that the government will want to see their financial situation before triggering the article, so it probably begins sometime after the end of the financial year. I reckon April or May 2017. Now, as soon as Article 50 is triggered, there will be shock waves, whatever the government or the Bank of England try to do to ease it. House prices will decrease as the National Treasury predicts that the general cost of borrowing would increase as a result of Brexit, ultimately decreasing the demand for housing. Simply put, lower demand equals lower prices. Also, because the cost of borrowing would increase, this would increase mortgage rates and ultimately increase interest rates overall, an opinion also shared by the former Chancellor, Mr Bean. I can easily see massive amounts of pressure put on the government from both the SNP and Sinn Féin as Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain. Should the government refuse their calls for referendums of their own, which I presume they will, there may be violence. I'm certain that if the Scottish were given another chance to gain independence, they'd take it. Think about a future where the UK is split apart is, in my opinion, quite depressing, but... Whilst it's not a probability at this moment, it's certainly a possibility. Once we've officially left the EU and all the first negotiations are said and done, London will lose its financial services passport and investment banks that shift operations abroad quickly will benefit from first movers' advantage, which is basically banking slang for getting the hell out. Loads of banks based in London will move to other EU zones to have full access to the single market, all this according to information from a report done by Deutsche Bank. CEO of JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, has already warned that thousands of jobs may be moved out of Britain, and the co-head of Goldman Sachs, Richard Nodder, wouldn't even rule out moving all the banks, 6,500 UK staff, to Europe when asked. That's some crazy stuff. And for all you people sitting there watching this thinking, I don't live in London, banks won't affect me. Trust me, banks affect everything in the economy, and the economy affects everything in our lives. Now, going back to the passport that I was talking about earlier, which allows banks in London to access the EU market of 28 nations, that'll definitely end. 
The Tory government could easily loosen some workers' rights laws or lower certain taxes to make London a more attractive financial centre again. Oh yeah, and what about all those foreign car companies that have factories based in the UK? It's easy to predict that many of those will also move too. Unless, of course, wages are suddenly reduced and labour laws are all but scrapped. In the end, it doesn't matter whether or not the Bank of England decide to use quantitative easing as a way to stimulate the economy. On the path this is going, the UK, or what's left of it anyway, will be in recession by 2019, leading to more extreme political views becoming popular just before a general election too. It just keeps getting better and better. But seriously, I could go into more detail on all the factors that could change this or that but then we'd be here for days. If you do want to do some research of your own, the internet is a wonderful place and has all the resources you need. Place comments down below on what your predictions are for the future. Who knows, there could be 5 million barrels of oil under Crawley. We could get a government that adopts an economic plan similar to Hitler's pre-war Germany. Hopefully without all the racism and sexism attached. As always, this has been Robert. You've been watching DCH. Thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you again soon.